You are probably asking yourself, why am I doing a top 10 games of 2019 when it's May right now? Well, I got a few reasons. One, it's my tradition and I would really feel bad skipping a year after doing this for five years. But the main reason is because of what's going on in the world right now with the quarantine and everything. And I know it's been a depressing time for many of you. And you know what, if you have to be stuck in a very small space, at least make it a happy place by enjoying what you do, which I hope is video games. And there are a lot of good games that came out last year and I want to celebrate them since, well, I owe video games a lot. So without further ado, here are my top 10 games that came out in 2019. I'm going to confess, I have never played the original Luigi's Mansion game until last year. Despite its critical acclaim, I thought it was, you know, just okay. The sequel didn't do much to entice me to the series either, but when I went to E3 last year, I got a taste of what all the hype was about. When I went to E3 2019, I actually had a chance to play Luigi's Mansion 3, and I was hyped for the game ever since. Not to mention, I actually got to meet THE voice of Mario and Luigi, Charles Martinet, before I got to play the game, and that's pretty cool! Luigi's Mansion 3 is easily my favorite game in the series. Not only that it looks amazing, but the animation is probably the best I've seen in any Nintendo game to date. Just look at Luigi's expressiveness. All the different floors have unique themes that add a much needed personality to the franchise, and even the multiplayer offerings? aren't too bad, uh, for the most part. The best part for me was Guiji itself, since a lot of the best puzzles in the game revolved around using its abilities to continue on. Luigi's Mansion 3 is a spooky and charming adventure every Switch owner will definitely enjoy. Okay, okay. Oh. I can dig it! But sometimes, sometimes, something crawls out from behind the poster. And the ones that see it happen freak out and try to forget what they saw. I'm here. Why did you bring me here? Control is a game that enwrapped with a lot of mystery. Just stepping into the Eero Bureau of Control trying to look for answers is enough to draw anyone to its psychedelic world. It hopes that the main character, Jesse, has some of the most fun abilities in recent memory. Her weapon of choice, the service weapon, can have several modes it can adjust on the fly. It can be either an auto-firing machine gun to becoming even a sniper rifle. But of course, the main show stealer are the psychic powers as Jessie can fling objects at enemies, control their minds, and later on in the game she can even fly in the air. The only elements that bring control down for me are the arcane map design, which might be the worst I've ever seen in a game since it does a poor job of showing altitude, and the enemies that can get pretty cheap with their one-hit death projectiles. But other than that, control is one heck of a trip that I don't really want to unveil too much about, I'm just saying that if you're looking for more intrigue in your action games, you need look no further. Originally when I wrote this entry, I had Mortal Kombat 11 much lower. Mostly because I was disappointed with the direction the story went, going with the whole time travel aspect of Mortal Kombat 9 did. Not to mention some of the more questionable casting choices, so... Yeah, I was a bit let down. So what changed? Well, in one word, Aftermath. I know it's not exactly fair to include a DLC that came out in 2020 for our list in 2019, but considering how late this video is coming out and the many technical difficulties I had to deal with, 
This only helps improving Mortal Kombat 11 in my eyes. MK11 is by far the best fighting game when it comes to production values. The graphics are amazing, facial animations are top notch, and the story mode alone has cinematography that can rival actual movies, no joke. The fighting system got a nice overall with some new mechanics to use, but I'm forgetting some old classics like the devastating fatal blows. The Crypt is now a fully realized 3D adventure filled with puzzles to complete, which is pretty awesome. I just wish its rewards weren't randomized and didn't feel like a grind. MK11 may not be my favorite of the franchise, but it does do a lot of things right, and shows the series isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Also major points for including movie Shang Tsung in the game, I love you Ed Boon! Oh, you can take my soul anytime. That is if I had a soul to begin with. I probably have to explain why I have Sword and Shield so low on this list. Especially after I put Sun and Moon at number 2 for 2016, which... If I go back, I would definitely place it a whole lot lower now. But trust me, I have a reason that I put Sword and Shield low, and it's not exactly what you may think. Most criticism that I saw against Sword and Shield were its visuals, and while I do agree the framer than the Wild Air could have been a lot better, I am honestly just happy to see Pokemon in HD. This is the first mainline console game in the series, and I did appreciate the fidelity upgrade to its models and menus. My main gripe, however, is the story as a whole. I did like some of the characters, especially Sonya because she's downright adorable. I just really found very little to do with Galar itself, and it didn't really have much of a personality. I especially dislike the pacing of the end game, which the game takes a not turn during the championship for no apparent reason. More importantly, I do think a lot of the mechanics of Gen 8 will be dated by the time J9 will come out. Maybe the wild area is some sort of a prototype for having the entire game being open-ended and players can choose which gyms to go to and tackle them at their own pace. I will admit I did enjoy Gen 8 more than I did 6 and 7, thanks to the shiny raids that I had the fortune of participating in as a shiny collector, and of course, the battles are just as fun as ever. So yeah, it may not be the best Pokemon title in the world, and I know it has a lot of controversy, but I spent close to 500 hours on it, and that has to mount for something, right? Borderlands is kind of like comfort food for me. Yeah, I know the third game in the series has garnered quite a lot of infamy, but I want to give credit to the developers who put their utmost effort into this game. A more viable criticism is the story took a giant nosedive. And no, not because of those streamer twins that granted can be kind of annoying, but their wretched Ava. Yes! That's so freaking cool, I want to die instantly. I'm gonna be a Vault Hunter too. <laughs> Or I would be if you would sign me more than just guarding a dusty-ass library and staring at water for like a hundred hours. Still, the gameplay loop of Borderlands remains some of the most fun I've ever had in a shooter. Explore a new area, defeat enemies, collect new weapons, upgrade abilities, and so on. And the amount of customization for each of the characters is staggering. In addition, a lot of necessary updates were done to the aging formula. Not only that players can complete a mission without having to backtrack all the way to the person who gave them the quest, but there is an actual fast travel feature that you can do anywhere in the map, thank god! This is a wonderful game to lose yourself into, especially if you have up to three friends to play with. And if that doesn't work, well, there is always Mad Moxie. And how can you say no to that? Uh, why do Kickstarters disappoint me so much? First, there was Mighty Number no. 9 that was a definite letdown, and while Ukulele wasn't as bad, eh, it could have been much better. And then finally, last year, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night came out, 
and will it actually repeat the other two games in the Trinity? Thankfully, no. Bloodstained is freaking amazing. Bloodstained is a sequel to Symphony of the Nine that we always yearned for, but even that sells the game a little bit short. For one, the main character Miriam can collect shards that grant her new abilities, either conjuring a weapon from thin air or summoning familiars. It's a shame the process seems to be kind of painful, though. <laughs> the crafting mechanic is deep, allowing players to upgrade weapons and abilities, and even making food can increase stats when the situation is dire. And of course, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention that Solid Snake himself, David Hayter, is part of the cast. <laughs> I knew what you are. That ghastly air about you. You reek of sorcery, Shardbinder. Bloodstained would have been a lot higher if I didn't run into a couple of game-breaking glitches. I played this game on PS4 Pro, and about 85% of the time, I had to wait 90 seconds to actually continue playing this game after death. This definitely broke my immersion, and a lot of the time I thought I had to restart the entire game because I thought something was legitimately broken. But your experience may vary. Still, despite some of those awful technical flaws, Bloodstain remains one of the best Kickstarted games ever and is highly recommended for anyone who wants a new Metroidvania. Considering I've never been big into Fallout, the fact that the Outer Worlds is this high is definitely surprising. But why? Why does this game do much better? Well, for one, I love space exploration. Two, the writing is sharp, and the dark humor fits the atmosphere well, especially when you have Best Girl Parvati in your party. Is this your ship? Oh my star, she is just so handsome! Does she have a name yet? What's her drive model? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Listen to me babbling. Three, I love the mix of shooting and RPG elements, since slowing down time can help maim enemies in critical moments. But the most important aspect to me is the freedom the game gives you as a player. Sure, putting points into weapons can help you storm a stronghold, but I find myself investing in more conversational skills than anything else. In fact, The Outer Worlds is the only game that I felt compelled staying away from the usual goody touches path I always partake in games. I lied, I swindled, I even intimidated when it was necessary. And for once, I didn't feel bad at all. Morality isn't always black and white, and many of the characters reflect that, even if the supposed good guys have a very dark edge to them. This is one of the best RPGs that I've played in recent memory, and if you like losing yourself in a living and breathing world, you'll feel just at home on the deck of the unreliable. Who's the sweetest boy? Who is it? Error. Unable to process the specific customer service request. Please repeat the order. Yeah, you are. My usual rule for top 10s is no remakes are allowed. So why is Resident Evil 2 on the list? Well, I believe that RE2 diverges so much from the original that it feels like its own unique game. Sure, it follows the narrative of the original game, and even the level design is pretty similar, but just about everything else is different. As someone who isn't that big into survival horror games, I always love the action of the franchise. 2 is a wonderful marriage between the slower pace of the classic games while still having tight controls like the later games in the series. It's also great that you get two different campaigns, and even after you finish them, there is an alternate version of their campaigns. There is a lot of replay value going on. And I can gush on and on about this game, but I especially want to commend the sound mixing. The scariest moments are the ones where there are no enemies on screen, but you can hear something is looming in the distance. The amount of times I heard Mr. X approach me with his booming steps in the background was one of the most terrifying moments I've had. <laughs> R 
Resident Evil 2 Remake is a technical marvel, and I implore all of you, even if you are a little bit scared, to check it out. Man, Capcom has been on an upward streak recently. The disappointing Street Fighter V has improved significantly since release, Mega Man 11 outdid Mighty No. 9 easily, the Resident Evil franchise is stronger than it ever was, and Monster Hunter World is one of the most profitable games of all time. So what is left for Capcom? How about bringing back an old friend? Devil May Cry 5 is the sequel I have always been waiting for, and mind you, I didn't even hate Ninja Theory's DMC like most people did, but even I can say it's nice to see OG Dante back in action. Heck, even Nero, a character I sort of despised the last time he showed up, has actually become relatable in this installment. Each of the three main characters are a blast to play with. Nero can use his prosthetic devil bringing arms to dish out pain, Dante has all of his classic styles and some new toys to play with, including a motorcycle he can use as an actual weapon, oh my god! And even Newcomer V, who plays much more slowly, offers a unique twist to gameplay with his familiars. The action is fluid, and thanks to the RE engine adding flair and spectacle to the franchise, I have a hard time deciding whether or not this game or the third is the best in the series, but at the very least, it's one of the best games I've played, in recent memory. Yeah! When Fire Emblem Three Houses was originally announced, I admit I was worried. The school setting, to me, felt like Nintendo is trying to sterilize the violence. I am so glad I was wrong, since the new setting is absolutely fantastic. Right from the get-go, choosing a house is a monumental decision, since each has their own story paths to partake in. It's great that every single student has their own class, and it can be taught a variety of different skills that can improve their performance in battles, and the tactical battles that the series is known for are as great as ever. But all of this wouldn't matter if the characters weren't good. And honestly, this might be the best Fire Emblem cast to date. The entire game is voiced, and the performances are stellar. Each character is well written, performed, and nuanced. I watched every single support conversation just so I could get to learn more about my ragtag crew. I can complain about some tactical elements that are being omitted like the weapon triangle, but it really doesn't matter to me in the grand scheme of things. Three Houses was released in a time that I really deemed it necessary. Right when my life was just getting worse, immersing myself into this deep and engrossing adventure is exactly what I needed. Finishing the Blue Lions campaign took me 90 hours, and the Golden Deer is not much shorter than that. Without gushing for hours about how excellent this game is, I can safely say that Fire Emblem Three Houses is by far my favorite game of 2019. Thank you all very much for watching, and I do hope the 2020 list won't come out in September at this rate.